In our last video lecture, we talked about proving statements involving the universal quantifier. In this lesson, we are going to discuss proofs of statements involving the existential quantifier. In order to prove a statement of this form, there exists x, p of x. There are two methods that we can use. The first one is the constructive method. For the constructive method, we name a particular object in our domain such that it satisfies the open sentence here. That is, we name an object A in U such that P of A is true. For example, there is an even prime number. What is that even prime number? We know that that is just equal to 2. So we just say that number 2 satisfies the given conditions. We just say in the proof that 2 satisfies the requirement here. It is even and it is a prime number. Next, there is a function f such that f prime, its derivative, is equal to itself. What will be that function? The first function that comes to mind would be the function e to the x. So we say the function f of x equals e to the x satisfies f prime of x is equal to f of x. Next, there exist real numbers a and b such that a plus b quantity squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. We know that this is not true in general. However, this is just saying that there are real numbers which can satisfy this equation. a plus b squared, we want this to be a squared plus b squared, but the left-hand side is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. And therefore, we want 2ab to be equal to 0. So therefore, it only means that at least 1 of a and b is 0. So we just take a to be equal to 1 and b be equal to 0. And then, we just show that it satisfies the given requirement. 1 plus 0 squared is the same as 1 squared plus 0 squared. Both of them are equal to 1. Next, there exists integers m and n such that 3m plus 5n is equal to 1. What will be the values of m and n? We have 1, 3 plus 5 is equal to 1. We can put 2 here and negative 1 here. So we have 6 minus 5 that is equal to 1. Take m to be equal to 2 and n to be equal to negative 1. Hence, 3m plus 5n is equal to 3 times 2 plus 5 times negative 1, which is exactly equal to 1. In all of these examples, we employed the constructive method. Another way of proving existence theorems is the non-constructive method. In this method, we use other existence theorems to show that an object in A satisfies P of A even if we do not explicitly know what A is. For example, the equation x to the fifth plus 2x minus 5 equals 0 has a real number solution in the closed interval 1, 2. In order to prove this, we will make use of the intermediate value theorem. It says that if f is a function that is continuous on the closed interval a, b, let's say that this is a and this is b, and our function is continuous, let's say something like that, on this interval a, b. And k is a number between f of a and f of b. Let us first locate our f of a. Let's say this is f of a. And this is f of b. And k is a number between f of a and f of b. Let's say that this is k. Then there exists a number c here between a and b such that f of c must be equal to k. So our k here is our f of c. So in order for us to use the intermediate value theorem, of course, we have to show that our 
function f satisfies the hypothesis here that it is continuous on the closed interval a b what will be our function here we will take our function f to be x to the fifth plus 2x minus 5 so for our proof let f of x be equal to x to the fifth plus 2x minus 5 first we have to show that it satisfies the premise that it is continuous on the closed interval 1, 2. Since f is a polynomial function, it is continuous everywhere and therefore it is continuous on this closed interval. Hence, it is continuous on the closed interval 1, 2. Next, we want to evaluate f of 1 and f of 2. Our f of 1 is 1 plus 2 minus 5. That's negative 2. And f of 2 is equal to 2 to the 5th, 32 plus 4, 36 minus 5, 31. And we want to show that this one has a real number solution. The intermediate value theorem says that if we get any number between f of a and f of b, there will be a corresponding x-coordinate. What will be that number between negative 2 and 31 that we want? We want that to be 0. Since 0 is between f of 1 and f of 2 by the intermediate value theorem, we get that there exists a real number C, element of the open interval 1, 2, such that 0 is equal to f of C and f of C is equal to C to the 5th plus 2C minus 5. So this is saying that C is a solution to this equation and since C lies in the open interval 1, 2, it also lies in the closed interval 1, 2. That concludes our proof. Next, between any two rational numbers x and y, where x is less than y, there is always a rational number z. Let us first write this using symbols. First, we have between any two rational numbers x and y, so that means we have for all x, y in Q, where x is less than y, there is always a rational number z. This means that if x is less than y, then there exists a z in Q such that z is between x and y. It's very important that you write the statement using symbols because this will guide you as to how you will go about your proof. Here is the strategy that we will use to prove this statement. Number one. First, we will start with let x and y be rational numbers because we have for all x, y. Next, what can you observe here? There exists a curse after the quantifier for all, which means that z depends on x and y. What would be a natural choice for z? What is that number between x and y? We can take z to be equal to the average of x and y. And to prove that this z works, you have to show that z satisfies the condition. This z that we constructed here, it satisfies two conditions. What are those two conditions? First, it has to be a rational number. And second is that z is between x and y. So this is how our proof will flow. So let us now begin our proof. We now know that we will start with let x and y be rational numbers. So hence, there exist integers m and p, q with 
n and q being non-zero such that x is equal to m over n and y is equal to p over q. We're done with for all x, y element of q. We are now here in this implication. So therefore, we assume, do not forget that, assume that x is less than y. And then we want to show there exists z. It's taken care of by this z here. We take z to be equal to x plus y over 2. And then note that. Note that x is less than x plus y over 2, which is less than y. Hence, it satisfies this one. I will leave it as an exercise for you to show that x plus y over 2 is a rational number. That concludes our proof. So again, just to summarize what we did here, we followed the statement in symbolic form as we go about our proof. We started with let x, y be rational numbers because of for all x, y in q. And then we have an implication. So that's why we assumed x is less than y. And then we wanted to show that the statement there exists z is true. So therefore, we had take z to be equal to x plus y. And then lastly, we show that this z that we constructed here satisfies the conditions that we want. Next, for every integer n greater than or equal to 7, there exist positive integers a and b such that n is equal to 2a plus 3b. Let us first get some specific examples here. Let's say that n is equal to 7. How will we write 7 as 2 times something plus 3 times something? And that something has to be positive. We can take 7 to be 2 times 2 plus 3 times 1. What about if n is equal to 8? How will we write 8 as 2 times something plus 3 times something? Can it be 4 here and then 0 here? No, because we want them to be positive integers. So this one should be at least 1. But if this is 1, we cannot write 5 as 2 times an integer. So let's try this to be 2. And there you go. Let us now try to generalize this for every integer n greater than 7. Again, before we proceed with our proof, let us write this using symbols. So in this case, our u here is the set of all natural numbers greater than or equal to 7. Therefore, we have for every n in u. Next, there exist positive integers a and b, element of z plus, such that n is equal to 2a plus 3b. How should we start? Let's start with let n be an integer with n greater than or equal to 7. That takes care of this one for all n in u. Next, we want to show the existence of a and b. Positive integers such that n is equal to 2a plus 3b. Now, this is only saying that we can write any integer greater than or equal to 7 to be 2 times a positive integer plus 3 times a positive integer. In order to have this 2 over here, we will divide our case into even and odd. So that's why I had this few examples here. We will proceed by proof by cases. So for case 1, assume that n is even. So that is n is equal to 2k for some integer k. How will we write 2k as 2 times an integer plus 3 times a positive integer? Since the numbers here are positive integers, the smallest number that we can take is 1. But just like what we did with the case n equals 8 here, we cannot have 1 here because this is odd and this is definitely even. So we have to start with at least 2. 
since this is 2k, I will have 2k. This is 6, so I will have minus 6. So that's minus 3. Can this be our a and b? We have to make sure that this is positive. Of course, 2 is already positive, so that's okay. We have to show that k minus 3 is greater than 0. This is where we are going to use the fact that n is greater than or equal to 7. Since n is greater than or equal to 7 and n is equal to 2k, what can you say about k? k must be greater than or equal to 4. Because the smallest even integer greater than or equal to 7 is 8. Since k is greater than or equal to 4, our k minus 3 here is strictly greater than 0. So take note that I no longer wrote here that take a to be k minus 3 and take b to be equal to 2. That is why it's important that you understand what this means. This means that you can write an integer greater than or equal to 7 to be equal to 2 times a positive integer plus 3 times a positive integer. Of course, we are not yet done. We have to proceed with our second case. Assume that n is odd. We have to write 2k plus 1 as 2 times a positive integer plus 3 times a positive integer. We already have an idea here that this can be 1. So this is 2k. I have 3 here, so I should have minus 2. So that's plus 1. And are we sure that k minus 2 is positive? What can we say about k here? Since n is greater than or equal to 7, the smallest possible value for k is 3. Thus, k minus 2 is strictly positive. So that takes care of the second case. So in both cases, we were able to write our integer greater than or equal to 7 to be 2 times a positive integer plus 3 times a positive integer. Take note that it's good also to have a few specific examples just so that you will have an idea of how you can generalize what you want to show. Take note that this is not part of the proof. This is just scratch just to give you an idea of how you should proceed. I did not even mention this in our proof. Next. For every real number a, there exists a real number b such that a squared minus b squared plus 4 is equal to 0. Again, we should start by writing it using symbols. For every real number a, I will no longer write element of real numbers automatically here. My assumption is that the domain is a set of real numbers. For all real number a, there exists a real number b such that a squared minus b squared plus 4 is equal to 0. What can we say about our quantifiers here? There exists comes after for all, which means that b depends on a. So let's have some scratch work first. We will start with let a be a real number. And then how do we get our b? such that a squared minus b squared plus 4 equals 0. We simply solve for b in this equation, right? So we will take b to be equal to square root of a squared plus 4. And as you can see, b really depends on a. For our proof, we will start with let a be a real number. And then there exists. So that's why we have take b be equal to square root of a squared plus 4. What are the properties that must be satisfied by b? b has to be a real number in the first place. Is b a real number? Yes, because a squared plus 4 is strictly greater than 0. So therefore, its square root exists. And of course, show that this is true. a squared minus b squared plus 4 is equal to a squared minus 
square root of a squared plus 4 squared plus 4, this is equal to 0. I just repeated this one here. This is exactly what we wanted to prove. So again, I just want to remind you that when you are proving an existential statement, once you have constructed your object, you have to make sure that it satisfies the given condition. So just like here, B must be a real number and that it satisfies this given equation. Next, there exists a real number X such that 3 minus X Y squared plus 1 is greater than 0 for all real numbers Y. Let us first write this using symbols. There exists a real number X such that 3 minus x y squared plus 1 is greater than 0 for all real numbers y. So we have for all y in here. Take note that the existential quantifier comes first before the universal quantifier, which means that our choice of x is independent of the choice of y. Let us have some scratch first before we write our theorem. We have there exists, so therefore we should start with take x to be 1. We still do, know, do not know what that is. And then we want to show that for any y, and then we have something like this. Let y be a real number. And then we must show that our choice of x satisfies this one. 3 minus x, y squared plus 1 is greater than 0. What can we say about y squared plus 1? Definitely, this is greater than 0, which means that we just want our 3 minus x to be positive, for this whole thing to be positive. So therefore, what will be a natural choice of x? We will take x to be equal to 2, so that this will just be equal to 1. We will use our scratch work here as our guide since we started with there exists. So that's why we start with let x be equal to 2. And then we have for all y here. So that's why we have let y be a real number. And then I will now write the fact that y squared plus 1 is positive so that I can have this inequality later on y squared plus 1 is strictly greater than 0. Hence, our 3 minus x, y squared plus 1, which is equal to 3 minus 2, y squared plus 1 is equal to y squared plus 1 is strictly greater than 0. So we have shown that 3 minus x times y squared plus 1 is greater than 0. And then for your conclusion, you can just say, therefore, we have found a real number x such that 3 minus x y squared plus 1 is greater than 0. That concludes your proof. For our last example, prove that for every natural number n, there is a natural number m such that for all natural numbers m greater than capital M, 1 over small m is less than 1 over 3n. What is the first step that we need to do? Always write it using symbols. What will be our domain here? Our domain here, I'll call that U, is the set of natural numbers. We have for all natural number N, so that I will no longer write for all N in the set of natural numbers. And then there is a natural number M. How about this for all natural numbers m greater than m? This part here is saying that m is an element of m plus 1, m plus 2, and so on. Let me just call this set S. So we have for all m in S, 1 over m is less than 1 over 3n. Now, for this one, I will change this part here to for all m. If m is in S, then 1 over m is less than 1 over 3n. Recall that in our video lecture on quantifiers, wherein we had a statement there that says that if S is a subset of your domain D, the 
statement for all x in s and then p of x, this is equivalent to for all x in d, so that's why I will just drop in d, then we have x is in s, then p of x. You might be thinking that this one is simpler than this one because this is an implication, but actually it depends. In this problem, it is easier if we work with an implication because we will have assume that. It will guide you that you will assume that M is in S. Now, let me just rewrite this instead of M, element of S. This is just saying that M is greater than big M. So for our scratch, how should we proceed with our proof? Number one, we have for all N. So we start with let N be a natural number. Next, there exists M. So we should have take M to be equal to something. We still don't know what that is. And that is exactly what we want to do. And what can we say about our M here? It is independent of small m, but it depends on small n. We should check this later when we have found our value for capital M. We shouldn't see any small m there. Next, we have for all m. So we have let m be a natural number. And then we have an implication. So we assume M is greater than M. And lastly, show that 1 over M is less than 1 over 3N. So this is what we want to achieve in the end. 1 over m is less than 1 over 3. And I am using the backward approach. So here we are starting with m is greater than capital M. This will help me find my choice of big M. 1 over m less than 1 over 3n. m and 3n are natural numbers. So therefore, when we get the reciprocal, what happens with the inequality? The inequality sign reverses. So we have m is greater than 3n. But look what we have here. The assumption is that M is greater than M. So therefore, what would be a natural choice for M? Take capital M to be equal to this one, 3N. Because if M is greater than 3N, 1 over M is less than 1 over 3N. Again, take note that this is just our scratch. Let us now proceed with the formal proof. So we start with let n be a natural number. And we already know what m is. Our m is 3n. Take capital M to be 3n. Take note that this is a good choice of m because it depends on small n but not on small m. Next. Let M be a natural number and assume that M is greater than capital M. We're already done with this part. Assume that M is greater than big M. We now show that 1 over M is less than 1 over 3N. Replacing M with 3N. We get M is greater than 3N and so 1 over M is less than 1 over 3N. And that is exactly what we want. This concludes your proof. You can also write for your conclusion that... Therefore, for every natural number small n, there is a natural number m such that for all natural numbers m bigger than m, 1 over m is less than 1 over 3 n. I just didn't write it here. Notice that it seems very simple. If we did not go about our scratch, you might be thinking that how will I be able to know that capital M is equal to 3 n? Most existence proofs require scratch 
So make sure that you do your scratch work before writing your formal proof.